इसलिए यूएसएसआर इवेंचुअली 1991 के आसपास डिसइंटीग्रेट हो गया यूएस एड वन द इविल यूएसएसआर एम्पायर वाज डिस्ट्रॉयड एंड ऑफ हिस्ट्री हां जापान इज लाइक हॉलीवुड इट्स लाइक डिज्नीलैंड फॉर द अमेरिकंस इट्स अ डेमोक्रेसी लाइक नाम का डेमोक्रेसी है भाई ग्रोथ इंजन ऑफ यूरोप वाज जर्मनी Germany has now entered a recession. When it comes to France, France gets most of its resources from Africa. Historically, Europe has always been a tribal war. Europeans have always fought each other. There have been hundred-year wars also. Every single leftist movement in the world has started from France. The original woke movement was the French Revolution. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And that is something where India and China are again clashing. Because India is actually positioning itself as the leader of the global south. China did not help anybody when there was COVID. India sent millions of vaccine doses for free, vaccine maitri, to every country that needed it without charging a single rupee in exchange. I'm honored to be here, and thank you very much. Let me have the pleasure of shaking you by the hand, as a Brit would say. <laughs> Namaste. आप सभी का स्वागत है आज के इस TJD podcast में. आज हम बात करेंगे कुछ geopolitics की. कि आजकल जो है वो विश्व किस ओर जाने वाला है और जा रहा है. और हमारे साथ बात करने के लिए हैं आपके जाने पहचाने अभिजीत चावड़ा जी अभिजीत जी आपका स्वागत है जयपुर डायलॉग्स के स्टूडियो में थैंक यू वेरी मच सर थैंक यू नमस्कार आजकल हम देख रहे हैं कि जिसको हम बोलते हैं जियोपॉलिटिकल फर्मेंट वो चारों तरफ दिखाई पड़ रहा है और ऐसा लग रहा है कि जो पोस्ट सेकेंड वर्ल्ड वॉर इंटरनेशनल ऑर्डर है वो कह सकते हैं कि अपने आप को री कर रहा है या कुछ लोग कह रहे हैं डिसमेंटल कर रहा है तो ये जो पोस्ट सेकेंड वर्ल्ड वॉर इंटरनेशनल ऑर्डर जो अमेरिका की लीडरशिप में बना था और उसने पूरे वेस्टर्न यूरोप को अपने अंडर ही ले लिया था एक तरह से जापान भी उसके कब्जे में ही आ गया था और ये यद्यपि उनको उन्होंने डेमोक्रेसी के नाम पर अलग अलग नेशंस रखा लेकिन ग्लोबल ऑर्डर में तो वो सब एक तरह से अमेरिका के पिछलग्गू रहे अब कुछ अलग सा दिख रहा है बहुत कुछ अलग दिख रहा है और 71 के बाद में जब डॉलर का पेग हटाया गया गोल्ड स्टैंडर्ड से और उसके बाद से जो एक तरह का कंज्यूमर बिहेवियर यूएस में हुआ यूएसए का अकेली कंट्री है जो सेविंग्स पर ग्रोथ नहीं करती है और पूरी दुनिया की सेविंग्स जो है वो उसको यूटिलाइज करती है अब जो चेंजेस दिख रहे हैं इंक्लूडिंग डी डॉलराइजेशन और इंक्लूडिंग चैलेंजेस टू दी मिलिट्री माइट ऑफ द वेस्ट एंड राइज ऑफ चाइना ये सारी चीजें जो है इसका अगर एक ट्रिगर पॉइंट आपसे पूछे तो आप क्या बताएंगे और कब कब कहां प्लेस करेंगे इसको ट्रिगर पॉइंट तो डेफिनेटली 1990s में द कलैप्स ऑफ द यूएसएसआर एंड द यूनिपोलर मोमेंट तो यूएसएसआर सुपर पावर था अनटिल 1990 1991 और इट इमर्ज इन द आफ्टर मैथ ऑफ द सेकंड वर्ल्ड वॉर तो सेकंड वर्ल्ड वॉर के एंड में जब ये खत्म हो रहा था तब इन्होंने ये ब्रिटेन वुड्स कॉन्फ्रेंस किया यूएस ने और उनके अलाइज ने उन्होंने डॉलर को एज द ग्लोबल रिजर्व करेंसी को स्थापित किया उसके बाद उन्होंने वेरी क्विकली यूके जो ग्रेट ब्रिटेन जो एक सुपर पावर हुआ करता था ग्रेट एम्पायर हुआ करता था उसको सबड्यू कर दिया 1958 में उनको ह्यूमिलिएट किया सुएज क्राइसिस में यूके और फ्रांस दोनों को एंड देन इट वॉज एसेंशली ए टू वे रेस यूएसए वर्सेज यूएसएसआर और यूएसएसआर हमेशा बैकफुट पर था क्योंकि इट वॉज अबाउट वन थर्ड ऑफ द यूएस इकोनॉमी एट इट्स मैक्सिमम एंड धीरे धीरे यूएस ने यूएसआर यूएसएसआर को एनसर्कल कर दिया 
and because of this uh, encirclement and because of the lack of access to trade routes to oceans iske liye and because of internal problems also isliye ussr eventually 1991 ke aas pass disintegrate ho gaya and this was the unipolar movement us had the us had won the evil ussr empire was destroyed now there was democracy in the ussr which is now russia sare ke sare jo central asian republics se aur baltic republics se ye sab nikal gaye ussr se and only russia was left and this was the great victory of the democratic liberal world order the us rules based world order or us ye maan gaya they believed they they made themselves believe that they had won everything this is the end of history like francis fukuyama <laughs> said end of history ha ah. <laughs> and that's it now everything is fine but nothing was fine to so, jab ye break up hua ussr ka तो व्हाई डिड इट हैपन लाइक आई सेड बिकॉज़ ऑफ मल्टीपल रीजंस आल्सो बिकॉज़ ऑफ इंटरनल प्रॉब्लम्स जैसे मैंने कहा जैसे कि गोरबाचव जो था ही वाज वेरी डेस्परेट फॉर वेस्टर्न प्रेज उनको पश्चिम से कोई कोई अच्छा वैलिडेशन वैलिडेशन मिले इसके लिए उनको बहुत ये था बहुत उत्सुक थे इसके लिए एंड ही एसेंशियली लोअर्ड द स्टैंडर्ड्स ऑफ द यूएसएसआर पेरिस त्रोई का ग्लास नोस लेके आए व्हिच इज सेल्फ क्रिटिसिज्म एंड ऑल दैट एंड इवेंचुअली बिकॉज़ ऑफ हिम you could say he was the last person who precipitated the precipitated the break up of the ussr uske baad thoda sa ek chaos ka period aaya there was this uh, siege of the russian parliament kisko aaya is pe ek minute aapko main rokunga ki jab hum gorbachev ko analyze kar rahe hain to jo western analysis ki aati hai wo ye aati hai ki uh, afghanistan adventure ruined the economy of uh, ussr is that a plausible explanation i don't because think, i very much doubt it see i don't think that the afghanistan economy is the thing that uh, of the Afga- uh, afghanistan misadventure is what precipitated the disintegration of ussr because of the economic downturn and effects i don't think so definitely unhone ye ye kiya unhone afghanistan mein ko invade kiya capture kiya aur unhone apna puppet government bitha diya wahan pe najibullah ka and they spent a lot of uh, money and resources defending afghanistan and the americans funneled in terrorists and free so called freedom fighters mujahideen via pakistan even osama was there osama bin laden fighting for the americans तो ये था बट आई डो नॉट सी सी दूएसएसआर का इकोनॉमी बहुत बड़ा था वन स्मॉल बिस्टर लाइक अफगानिस्तान के नो ड्रू इन द एंटायर नेशन इन द एंटायर इकोनॉमी इट वाज अ लॉन्ग टर्म सिस्टमिक इश्यू देर वर लॉट्स ऑफ क्रैक्स दैट इमर्ज विद इन दूएसएसआर द स्टैंडर्ड्स हैड बीन लोअर्ड ग्रेजुअली एवर सिंस द डेथ ऑफ स्टालिन स्टैलेंट के बहुत हाई स्टैंडर्ड्स थे फ्रॉम द परस्पेक्टिव ऑफ अ डिक्टेटरशिप उसके बाद स्टैंडर्ड्स धीरे धीरे लैक्स होने लगे दे स्टार्टेड फॉलोइंग बैक इन द सुपर कंप्यूटर रेस इन टेक्नोलॉजी दे हैड इंटरनल करप्शन तो ये सारे इफेक्ट्स धीरे धीरे क्यूमुलेटिवली 1990s तक बहुत बड़े हो गए थे एंड गोरबाचोव वॉज द गाय हु इंसन ऑफ टाइम हुन ऑफ करेक्टिंग एवरीथिंग made things worse and it was not afghanistan that that uh, in my opinion some people even say that uh, the the uh, chernobyl disaster was the t- trigger for the ussr's collapse no it was not a trigger it was a symptom of the issues within the ussr and even the debacle in afghanistan i mean why did they have to withdraw from afghanistan i'm not really sure they were in control of large parts of afghanistan there was this this uh, thing happening the mujahideen being uh, sent into afghanistan via pakistan wo chal raha tha but i am sure they could have you know if they had persisted they could have you know been able to tide over this crisis so eventually ye sab tha i think the the main issue was gorbachev and his policies and he gave too much freedom see in a, in a, in any nation there has to be a balance of power bharat mein federalism hai aur central government hai there is a kind of equilibrium between the two ussr mein republics the the soviet socialist republics ssrs so by the time the 90s came around gorbachev seems to have given too much power away to these republics and when the final thing happened of the siege of the parliament happened everybody declared independence because they realized that the the central government and the ussr is no longer in a position to hold on to us by force so sab nikal gaye and gorbachev allowed this to happen or fir fir siege hua of the parliament i think one of the reasons was that gorbachev was too fond of the democratic uh, yeah. label and He, when he negotiated with the us in that 1991 conference happened at that time uh, he wanted to get absorbed into the nato you remember yeah he started the process in 1996 1986 there was another uh, uh, big uh, summit meeting in geneva okay between ronald reagan he Rick wanted and... to become part of the west yeah so he was started he had started Because, this process uh, but the west uh, i think uh, it had its own prejudices the so west had no 
desire to absorb you, Gorbachev and elevate him to any position, they used him for a pizza advertisement. Domino, okay, pizza Hut or Domino's or whatever. That's what it was. Okay, our, we have destroyed our country, but at least we now have Pizza Hut or Domino's, whichever it was. So we have pizza now, Western pizza, so everything is good. So that's the kind of guy he was. He essentially was responsible, in my opinion, to a large extent for what happened as the supreme leader of the Soviet Union. So that was a disintegration of the USSR. Then Boris Yeltsin comes to power, the drunkard. And he was a total Western stooge. Total. What he did is this. See, in the USSR, the economy, everything that was produced by the people of the USSR was held collectively by the state. It was their money, their savings of decades that was held by the state on their behalf. The state was the custodian, the guardian of the savings of the entire nation. So from 1945 until 1991, whatever they had worked for and accumulated and saved was the was the money of the USSR and Yeltsin privatized everything, which means that he put, he placed all this money in the hands of a few thugs, the so-called oligarchs, and then they proceeded to systematically ruin the economy and giving, gave all the money away. And essentially, this, this during this decade, the USSR was infiltrated by Western companies and Western uh, interests. So it kind of became an extension of the West. And then you also had the ruinous Chechen war, the first Chechen war that the, that the Russians lost very badly to the Chechenians. And at that time, Chechnya became a de facto independent country, right? So that's what Yeltsin did. He was a disaster as a leader. He, and this is, so when... He, he was the... Um, Zelensky of Russia. He was the Russian Zelensky. Russian indeed, Zelensky. Indeed. We have other, yeah, I can give other Indian examples also, but we will refrain from that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so what happened in 91 when the USSR was disintegrating, uh, had disintegrated and there was the question of the reunification of Germany because Germany was also divided into East and West Germany. East was, the East part of Germany was under the control indirectly of the USSR. So there was a question of the reunification of Germany and the West gave the Russians the explicit promise, not in writing but verbally and many times verbally, that NATO will not expand even an inch eastwards. This was told to the Russians multiple times in in words, not in writing, in 1991. They, and, and they, they made the Russians suckers. <laughs> they made, took the Russians for suckers. And as soon as, the, the, as Germany was reunified, almost immediately they started expanding westwards. And it kept on going, going, going. And then Yeltsin, uh, eventually he was too old and too weak and too drunk to govern. So they brought in a new guy, Putin. And they thought he would be another docile, uh, you know, uh, easy to manipulate kind of person. But he turned out to be something very different. Between the disintegration of the USSR and uh, rise of Putin, the GDP per capita income of USSR or Russia had declined by 38%. It was total ruination of the country. And all the savings of the entire nation were, were pocketed by some oligarchs. So, and all the industries were ruined. The space program which the Russians had was one of the best space programs in the world. The Buran, uh, the Buran uh, space shuttle is still lying there somewhere in ruins and utter ruins. So much of the, and, and most, most of the best scientists and engineers were absorbed by the West or by China. India also had, had the opportunity. We did not take the opportunity. So all the best minds went outside the country, and this, and what was what you were left with was the most mediocre people. So that was the disaster that happened in the nineties. There was also Russia. a beautiful artifice they had devised, and that was that uh, they would uh, pledge shares for loans, <laughs> these oligarchs, and then uh, they would default. They would default, yeah, enabling takeover of their companies. By That's the it. So the assets have to be dissolved, right? They have to be taken over. That's it. That's, that, that's how, how much of Russia was sold out to the West. That's what happened. So then Putin comes to power and then Putin painstakingly begins the process of first of all shoring up the economy and then rebuilding Russia to some semblance of what it used to be. So it took at least a decade in, in between. There was this, uh, this uh, little uh, war kind of thing in Georgia and other parts of the, of the thing and all. So Putin bided his time and he was very clear that he's going, to, he's going to rebuild Russia. He's going to first of all make it defensively invulnerable. And then he will look into in the future or what can be done. So even today, I would say Russia is not completely in a position to take over the lost territories it once had. But it is definitely in a position that nobody can mess with it.
Russia has now risen to that stage. And, and Putin ensured that the army is once again well-funded. The army had gone into a shambles during Yeltsin's time. It was starved of, of, of money, of supplies, of whatever it needed, and it was in a shambles. And that's why it lost the Chechenian war, the first Chechenian war. So after Putin comes to power, he goes back into Chechnya. The second Chechen war happens. He flattens the city of Grozny, and then he puts... Uh, Kadyrov, Ahmad Kadyrov into power, he becomes a Russian vassal or puppet, whatever you call it. Then Ahmad Kadyrov is killed in a bomb, bomb explosion. His son, Ramzan Kadyrov, takes over and is still in power in Chechnya. So in Chechnya, you have a king, Ramzan Kadyrov. But if you go to his house, there are two big portraits on the wall. One is his father, Ahmad Kadyrov. The second is Vladimir Putin. So it's essentially, that's the way Chechnya is done. So Putin made sure that everything gets stabilized. He had to go to war in Chechnya. He did it. The... And, and then he started rebuilding the armed forces. And today the Russian armed forces are very much ca more capable. M maybe they are as capable as uh, the way they used to be in the 1970s or 80s. You know, they have risen again. And now the technologies obviously are different. They are, you know, they are, uh, they, are they have drones and all that. So uh, you had a unipolar moment from, let's say, 1991 until 2015, 2017. That was the age of unipolarity. Only one big power, the USA. And every... Everywhere in the world, their hegemony ruled. So you had to abide by what they said. You may be an independent country, but you cannot cross certain lines and you will have to consult with them for a variety of things. So that and was the... And they funded China. And they, the USA. <laughs> so that's where, where that's where Nixon and Kissinger come in. So in the 1960s, 1970s, you had Nixon and Kissinger. Kissinger was the uh, Secretary of uh, State of the USA, German-born guy. And Nixon was the president. And what happened in 1969, if I'm not mistaken, the, the year, there was this brief Sino-Russian war, Sino-USSR war. Usuri the the Usuri River clash. So there, 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 is this, there was a disputed territory over there. And the Russians, uh, the, the Chinese were bitter about having to, they had to lose territory that they once in some, some time had temporarily occupied. So then there was this clash, uh, the, uh, the Sino-USSR border. 18, 1865 or so. That, uh, yeah, the 19th century. They lost a lot yeah. of territory. Hmm. Uh, what you have, Eastern Russia, Vladivostok and all that. All that, all that, yes. That, that was briefly. Briefly. Uh, Briefly, Qing Dynasty or something. Qing Dynasty. Yeah. So, Today's China huh. harbors the dream of... Of course, of course they do. Uh, occupying all we'll, the territories of the... Well, welcome to that. It's a very interesting topic actually. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this Usuri River clash in the 19... In 1969, if my memory serves yes, right. Yes, yes. Yeah. It was 1969. Right. And hundreds, several hundred soldiers died on both sides. And then, there, and then the Soviets... So China was defeated. China was defeated and the Soviets then decided, they actually took the decision of launching a nuclear strike on China. The Americans somehow came to know about it and they intervened at the last moment and threatened the USSR that if you launch a nuclear strike on China, we're going to launch a nuclear strike on you. So that is what prevented the USSR from, from nuking China. And then they did this outreach with China, the Americans. Uh, Kissinger and Nixon went to Beijing, they met Mao and all that. This was the uh, gradual opening up of China and they they perhaps naively with imagined... Pakistan's mediation. With Pakistan's mediation. <laughs> Yaya, was it Yahya Khan? Yeah, yeah. Yahya Khan, right? Yeah, all that. So, and they apparently imagined, it, it is said that China, once it becomes more prosperous, it will become democratic and then we can absorb it into the committee of nations and it will become a responsible power and all that nonsense. <laughs> so the Chinese, they, they said, okay, very good. Come on, we are opening up our economy gradually, step by step. It started, I think, in 1979, the process. After Mao's death. After Mao's death, with Deng Xiaoping coming in. It's a slow process. There was also this Vietnam, this war with Vietnam that the Chinese lost, 79. That was also the time of the internal conflict within the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, yeah the old gang of four and all that stuff that was going on within internally, yes. So then you had the debacle in Vietnam and then the Chinese started opening up their economy very painstakingly, very slowly. But it, the process really took off in the 1990s. So around the time, the unipolar moment happens. And then the Americans said, we have defeated the Russians. Now let's open up the Chinese economy. Let's, let's have them produce whatever stuff we are too, too bored to produce. All the, all the venial work. So that's what they okay. did. We have a dollar. 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 We have a this is what they did. So that's how they, they transformed China into a manufacturing superpower. 
when i first went to the us when was it 2001 or something i i go to radio shack or i go to best buy or whatever then i see all the electronics items if you turn them back and you see where is it manufactured it's all made in china i was like kya ho raha hai at that time i was not really aware of all that, that uh, let me just pause you for a minute japanese were they manufacturing superpower in the 1980s hmm. and uh, then the us played a trick on them plaza the plaza accords hmm. and uh, they set them back they destroyed they, the japanese economy they destroyed the japanese economy yes. the japanese economy hasn't It recovered no, till date no it has not 30 years it is the same place yes one stroke of the pen 35 years now the bank yeah. of japan the see the deal with japan is that since 1945 japan is under permanent us military occupation there are more than 130 permanent us military bases on japanese soil the japanese constitution was written in 1945 by american generals until today not a single word has been changed japan is not a free nation japan is a nation that is laboring under the heavy boot of the us imperialist superpower Japan is under permanent US military occupation the bank of japan is controlled by the US every single major policy decision that's either internal or external or from military perspective in japan is only done after getting US sanction US approval everything is controlled by the US japan is like hollywood it's it's like disneyland for the americans if they want to go for a vacation they go to japan they, they own the country so that's the situation in japan today most people don't realize because there are elections in japan it's a democracy like naam ka democracy hai bhai everything is controlled by the us but they allow them to hold elections so yeah see democracy human rights sab ho gaya that is the sham that is uh, that is foisted upon the world like taiwan uh, taiwan is another yeah that's another interesting case <laughs> so in the 1980s they the, the they made the bank of japan change certain tweak certain things you know change interest rates and things like that the plaza accords they they, they fixed the japanese yen at a certain rate they pegged it at a certain rate and all that so the cumulative effect of all that was that the japanese economy went into a decline it is still declining 35 years like you said it is still you know suffering from the consequences of what happened in the plaza accords so this was at that time japan was the second largest economy in the world they had come out of the shambles of the destruction of the of hiroshima and nagasaki and the thousands of bombing raids the americans did on them and they had rebuilt their country of course they were under us military occupation but they still worked incredibly hard they rebuilt their country by the 1980s they were the second largest economy in the world this small island nation small island nation did that and they were the most technologically advanced society in the entire world they still are their their technology is 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 second to none they actually are a shadow nuclear power they can have nuclear weapons next week if they want to they have the know how and they have one of the best space programs in the world their technology is second to nobody that's how advanced japan is but the americans destroyed the path because they saw that japan could ev- eventually by 1990 or so become the number one economy that's they were capable of that and the americans did not want that to happen prestige and blah 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 so they destroyed the japanese economy they just made a small change a couple of small changes and slowly it went down <laughs> they 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 tweak the exchange rate <laughs> yeah yeah they tweak the exchange rate they, they made the, the bank of japan lower some interest change some interest rates and all that and that basically led to that a massive decline that, in consumption in japan that created the real estate bubble there all that and as a consequence even the birth rates have declined dramatically in japan the japanese society is like it's it's a disaster zone actually you know people are not having children the total fertility rate is what 1.2 1.3 Uh, no, it's less. I think is it less than that? Okay, I don't remember exactly what it is. It's not good. I mean, it's it's nowhere close to good. That's how bad it is. So that's what they as bad as China. China zero point nine. Okay, last I saw it was one point one or one point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, slightly better than China. China okay. is zero point nine. Okay, China has gone beyond one now. My goodness. So that is all of their own making. Okay, they cannot blame and, the Americans. And it is said that the, even that one child policy was actually. Persuaded by the United States. Okay, even that one child. The one, one, one child policy. Achha, achha. So, achha, if you talk about persuasion of United States, you allow United States to do anything to you, you're gonna bear, bear the consequences. You'll end up with it in a few generations' time. Yeah. You won't see it right now. Right now, it's like nice, nice, achha. बाद में मालूम पड़ेगा बिल्कुल yeah so china's total fertility rate is another disaster and that is entirely of their own making. If the Americans persuaded them, them to have one, actually they did them a favor. <laughs> I mean, actually, they wanted to. Now they are saying three, four, five, whatever. It's too late. Our incentive, it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. It will take at least two, three generations for the results of that to come in. But by that time, the Chinese population is going to be very old. See, right now, the average age in China is thirty-eight. Today, by twenty fifty, it's going to be around fifty or so. 
by 20 by 2100 china's population will be around 700 million that's the projection and it's going to be an elderly population there are going to be very few young people and children who's going to man the that's, nuclear submarines that's the time to occupy china tibet yeah <laughs> <laughs> so the, even now they don't have uh, people to um, enlist in the army tibet is a, is a punishment posting essentially and then the India border is a punishment posting for them because the altitudes there are so shockingly high. Even if you just go out of the sun, you're going to have to get a sunburn. Okay. And, and you can't breathe there. And so some people uh, simply can't acclimatize to that kind of uh, environment. So the oxygen is very thin there. The cold is shocking. It goes to minus 30, minus 35 degrees in winter. So the Chinese are, are you know, they can't, they can't withstand those temperatures. Our guys, the ones who especially live in the hills and mountains, the Pahari people, the Indo-Tibetan border force, and the common Indian soldier who is properly acclimatized in the Siachen camp and all that, they can deal with this. They, they, they know how to withstand this hardship. The Chinese don't. They make this big bravado and show of force and social media stuff of their helicopters flying in Tibet and all. Take care, come We'll, we'll see. Oh, they can win video games, maybe. They can win video games, for sure. And the thing about the Himalayan border with Tibet is that it is such that technology takes a back foot and the quality of the soldier takes the front foot. Because exactly. Yeah. That's what happened in Galwan. Because you can't use tanks there. Your helicopters and planes, I mean, they, if they're at such a high altitude, they will perform at 50% of their capacity. You know, I mean, if you have a car that has a certain horsepower over here in, in let's say in Mumbai or Jaipur, you take it to lay and with half the oxygen available, it's going to perform at half the, uh, its capacity. So it's, it's a power output will be about, about half of what it is over here. And the, the same goes for tanks, the same goes for aircraft and all that. Especially and aircraft, one of helicopters. the factors that is, is that Altitude. all our uh, air platforms, Assam. they are all operating out of an Lower altitude, altitude of 100 meters yeah. or in Assam, even 50 meters or zero meters. That's the kind of altitude. So the they're performing, they're taking off with full load. The full payload they can take. Full payload. From Tibet, they can only take half the payload. Yes. So, kitna leke aenge? so we have advantages, but we cannot be complacent. Because the Chinese now are waking up to the problems they have. First of all, the, the one issue that they face in Tibet, in, in Chinese occupied Ladakh, etc., is that they are completely vulnerable because they're completely exposed. There is no forest cover there. Whatever they're doing is completely visible. If we can track them through satellites and through other means. Even at night, we can track the thermal signatures from low earth satellites and all that. So they're completely exposed. So what they're doing now is that they're creating bunkers that are under mountains and all that. Because our Brahmos missile can take out these things at a moment's notice, very fast missiles. So now they're creating bunkers under mountains and all, which from in which they will be possibly safe from Brahmos and other kinds of strikes. So they are now waking up to the problems, the issues that they face in Tibet and in Chinese occupied Ladakh. So we should not be complacent. Obviously, we have certain significant advantages, but well, they have money and they also are, are not, well, they're not stupid. They will also take all possible precautions they can. But overall, if there is a war in this region, it's going to be a man-to-man -man war. It's not going to be a technology versus technology war to a large extent. Because technology will take a back foot. In that, I think the Indian soldier who is naturally larger, stronger than the Chinese and more acclimatized and defending his own motherland as, as opposed to China who are in... Very a, well trained. Yeah, very well trained. And the Chinese are fighting on a territory that's not Chinese. Chinese have a conscript army. Conscript army. They are forced to... <laughs> you, you, I've seen that video in which they're crying because they have been sent, sent to the yeah, yeah, India, yeah, India Tibet border. Conscript army. Hmm. And our army, even, they, even in the Agniveer recruitment, uh, we had one is to ten ratio for recruitment. Hmm, right. For every one Agniveer, there were ten people fighting for them. Right. So, so there is a demand. Voluntary yes. army even for Agniveer. Yes. But the other thing is that our soldiers are motivated from a different perspective. They are fighting for their motherland. They are fighting on their territory. Tibet is not Chinese territory. The Chinese have no cultural, emotional association with the soil of Tibet. For them, it's just an invasion that they are launching from someone else's territory. They have no such thing. Even if Nepalese Gurkha soldiers fight against the Chinese, they are still fighting for their motherland. Nepal, India, essentially the same culture, same people. And if the Chinese do something with India, they'll also do it with, with Nepal. So it's the same thing. So we have these advantages, but we cannot be complacent. I'm sure, I'm not saying we are complacent. I'm just saying that we should never ever be complacent in the future at any given point in time. Um, so China obviously has a huge uh, military. No doubt. I think their annual military budget may be 200, 300 billion dollars. Maybe more it is said. Who knows? And so they are spending a lot on the military. They have modern weapons apparently which are untested. Okay, coming back to the US, amidst all this, after 
finishing off Japanese economy and uh, outsourcing their manufacturing to what they thought was going to be the next vassal state, China, and uh, ending the history and uh, generally lording over the world in their unipolar moment. Where did they slip up and since when? Yeah, so it's all about hubris, it's about overconfidence. They thought that they had uh, done everything, achieved everything, ab kuch karne ko hai. and they slipped up in not understanding what Putin was all about, all about. They thought that he would be another Yeltsin kind of guy who would be easily manipulated. And they used people like Merkel, etc. to strike up a good friendship with him and all. Because Putin had served as a KGB agent in Germany. And he, spoke, he speaks fluent journal, uh, German. So they thought that they would be able to control Putin. But Putin has his own mind, his own ideas, his own uh, vision for his country. And the US was complacent. They thought that China will be our creature. Putin will be something, somebody we can control. And they also went on this rampage. I mean, you know, the 2003 invasion of... Uh, was it Iraq, was it? Yes, it was Iraq. They also invaded Afghanistan and spent 20 years there. At the end of the entire process, they were they handed over Pakistan, they handed over power from the Taliban to the Taliban in, in 20 years in Afghanistan. <laughs> That's what they did. They handed over power and they handed over Afghanistan. And in Iraq, they handed it over to ISIS. They handed over to ISIS. They created ISIS. They created Al-Qaeda also essentially in, in various forms. They sometimes fought ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Sometimes they used ISIS and Al-Qaeda to fight certain battles. They invaded Syria. They went on a rampage around the world, the Americans, thinking that they rule the world now. And what they did not realize is that China is rising. And uh, in 2012 or whenever it was that uh, Mr. Xi Jinping came to power, suddenly the entire tune of China changed. Uh, you had the 2007 uh, Economic crisis also, the Lehman Brothers and all that crisis in the US. And the Chinese at that point, I think they, they decided that now our time is about to come. And when Xi Jinping came to power, he said that now our time has come. No more hide and bite, like Deng Xiaoping said. So then the entire tune, the attitude of the Chinese diplomats suddenly changed around 2012. They went for, from being very placid and very meek and very submissive people to suddenly the wolf warriors that we see today. So the entire tune of China changed. The Chinese realized that now we are past a certain stage. We are we have crossed the ten $10 trillion dollar mark, economy mark, and now we are no longer a pushover, and we will no longer bend it to the U.S. will. So that's around the time that the Chinese started standing up for themselves, and then they they were doing color revolutions all, all, all around the world. They took out Muammar Gaddafi. They took out various. Uh, they took out uh, Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. Gaddafi in Libya. So they went on spreading democracy wherever they wanted to spread. But that created a huge amount of resentment in the world. And with social media, people now started seeing what had the pattern that had been happening. The Americans have been propping up dictatorships everywhere and destroying nations everywhere they go. So their entire that that, that uh, spiel of being pro-human rights and pro-democracy, it was totally exposed. Social media did that. And then in 2014, the Americans launched another uh, coup, color revolution, whatever you want to call it, the Euromaidan coup in Ukraine. So the democratically elected government was unconstitutionally ousted and a new regime was brought into power in Ukraine, uh, which, was, which was a pro-US regime. And then immediately the new regime, they went on, a, they, they started, uh, uh, they started bombarding and shelling the people of Luhansk and Donetsk which is uh, the region that Russia has now liberated, they say liberated from Ukraine. So there was a civil war going on since 2014. When the new regime came into power in Ukraine, Putin decided it's time to reclaim Crimea because Crimea had never been Ukrainian territory. It was put into as part of Ukraine by Joseph Stalin, if I'm not mistaken, yes. as for administrative purposes only. Yes. Right? It was always Russian territory. So then Putin went on, the, he did this Crimea operation and he uh, re, reunited Crimea with with Russia. And then Putin tried and tried and tried to find a negotiated settlement to what was happening in Luhansk and Donetsk. There was the Minsk Accords Part 1, uh, you know, Mark 1, 1.0, then Minsk, Minsk Accords 2.0. And later it emerged, Angela Merkel inadvertently slipped up and said that the, the Minsk agreements were merely a ruse, a ploy to buy time. To, to build up Ukraine's military so that they could take a, take on a, U, a Russian military uh, operation. So they the NATO forces uh, and, and brains understood very clearly that it's going to lead to war. 
they knew it. I mean, uh, people like Mearsheimer and Brzezinski have been saying for a long time, more than 20 years ago, uh, the, the, the uh, NATO expansion, especially in Ukraine, will, will lead to a war. They've been saying that. They, they had the, the foresight to see that. And maybe that was the plan. Uh, the plan maybe was to do exactly that, to, to drive Russia into war. And they may have perhaps calculated that Russia is not ready for a war. They don't have the wherewithal and all that to to uh, to engage in a sustained military operation with NATO forces or NATO proxy forces. Well, they were clearly mistaken because Russia is an autarky. An autarky is a nation that produces all its uh, whatever it needs. It doesn't have to import anything. So Russia has, produces its own oil, its own natural gas, petroleum products, all that. Its own iron ore, its own lignite, which is which is coal ore, its own agriculture products. It doesn't need to import anything from anywhere. It is completely self-sufficient in all the basic necessities and commodities. So Russia is an autarky and they have this massive industrial might. So they are right now producing ammunition, which is needed for war, sustained wars. They are producing ammunition 24 by 7 by 365. They don't sleep. The fact is, don't stop. They just keep on churning out the shells and the bullets and missiles and whatever is required. So, they, and they have reserves. The Russians have reserves. They have three hundred thousand or more reserves that have not been used. Uh, military personnel who have not yet been put into battle because they anticipate eventually it's going to be war with NATO itself. So, the next phase could be Poland. So, right now, what NATO is doing, what the US is doing, is that they are deindustrializing Europe. So, what they are doing, first of all, Europe, the the major uh, growth engine of Europe was Germany. Germany is the main uh, industrial powerhouse of Germany, uh, of, of Europe. And Germany, its its uh, industrial base was, was benefiting from cheap Russian gas. Because to have an industry, to have a huge economy, you need power, you need energy. And energy comes from mainly fossil fuels, hydrocarbons. So it was coming from cheap Russian gas. And then the Americans blew up Nord Stream uh, one of the two uh, pipelines, and then the Russians also, also cut down the oil, uh, sorry, the gas supplies to Europe. So today what's happening is that Europe is forced to import LNG, liquefied natural gas, from the US at about three times the price they were getting from Russia. So that is a recipe for disaster, and that's why Germany has now entered a recession. When it comes to France, France gets most of its resources from Africa. They still control much of Africa, neo-colonization or proxy colonization. What the West does is that they install puppet states in Africa, dictatorships. Some have been around since 1979. Some have been around since 1983. And so uh, recently there was this coup in Niger, in, uh, in the Sahel region, in, Western, in the western part of Africa. And Niger is, it produces about 5% of the world's uranium. And France, five percent, and they have the highest grade uranium in Africa. And France, its electricity output, seventy percent of it is from nuclear power. So France is the major consumer of Niger's uranium, which is very high quality uranium. And France was importing uranium from Niger at at what eighty cents a kilo. Eighty cents a kilo. The global price is two hundred dollars a kilo. Mm. So imagine they were essentially stealing Niger's uranium resources for essentially free. And the French have this entire elaborate system of controlling the entire currency, the, the CNF franc 1, CNF franc 2. They have a puppet organization called ECOWAS, Economic Confederation or Coalition of whatever of West African states. So that also has gone to war at various times on France and the West's behest. So that's the kind of thing that's happening. So now, and Niger is also important because there is this uh, pipeline, gas, gas pipeline that's supposed to pass through Niger from Nigeria all the way to Europe. And if Niger is no longer under Western control, French control, then this cheap supply of gas that will start coming into Europe in the next few years, it won't come. So once again, the other input of gas that could come into Europe, cheap gas, maybe won't happen because Niger is now an independent country. And maybe the Americans want this to happen. They want to starve Europe of cheap uh, energy. They want to deindustrialize Europe. And what the Americans are doing is that they are now propping up Poland as Europe's new military superpower. So what could eventually happen is that maybe Russia takes over half or two thirds of Ukraine eventually, whenever it happens. Uh, and whatever is left of Ukraine will be integrated into Poland. That is a real possibility today. Because uh, uh, there are places in, in Ukraine that were once Polish territory, especially in Western Ukraine. So Poland definitely would love to reintegrate those regions into their country. 
So a lot, lot of Ukrainian history is actually intertwined with the, the Russian history as well. Oh yes, yes, yes. If you want to, we can talk about that. So if you go back to, if you go back a thousand years, there was no Ukraine, and the the, the Slavic people are the ancestors of today's Russian people. Uh, there, there. So about a thousand years ago, their leaders were a group of Vikings, the Kievan Rus. Okay, and uh, their capital at that time was Kiev. It was the capital of the Kievan Rus, the ancestors of today's Russians. And this region, which is today called Ukraine, it was at that time called Ukraina, which means the borderlands, the borderlands of the Slavic people's uh, homeland. So it was Russian territory. And it's sometime in the 19th century that this Ukrainian nationalism came up and they have a slightly different way of speaking, a slightly different dialect. Ukrainian, you can say, is a dialect of Russian. They all understand Russian. They can all speak Russian. So it's like uh, the difference between maybe uh, Marwadi and Gujarati or something like that. You know, it's, it's a very small difference. Yeah. Yeah, that sort of thing. So, uh, so Ukraine, then like we, we discussed, Stalin made, uh, he, uh, so th there's a whole history behind that. I think uh, some parts of Ukraine at some point in time were parts of Poland. There was the Lithu Lithuania and all that also. There's a whole history behind that. But historically, it was Russian. Yes, Eastern Europe has uh, undergone so many changes oh, of so borders. Many, so many changes. You had so many, uh, so many changes, so many changes of border. If you go back into German history also in the 19th century, it is oh, shocking. Yes. Germans, uh, I think the um, uh, powerhouse uh, or the locomotive of Germany was Prussia. Prussia. And Prussia is no longer with Germany. <laughs> it's integrated with Poland. That's the thing, right? Europe has seen so many changes. And Germany was incredibly fragmented in the 19th century. It was the Iron Chancellor Bismarck who, who unified everything in 1871 and created a new nation for the first time, a, a German nation for the first time. The Germans were always divided into various principalities and these things and uh, those things, little dukes and all those things. But Bismarck unified the entire nation into one cohesive nation and uh, he was the Iron Chancellor. And he said when he was dying that whatever is happening right now in Europe is going to lead to war in 20 years. That was World War One. He was right about that. So. Yeah, so that's how it was. So Europe has all, see, since 1945, Europe has been remarkably and reasonably stable and peaceful. You have the EU, you have NATO, these coalitions that work together. But historically, Europe has always been a tribal war. Europeans have always fought each other. There have been hundred year wars also. There have been so many horrific wars in Europe. So why has Europe been peaceful and stable for, since 1945 until today? Because Europe, because the major power in Europe today is neither Germany nor France, it's the US. US. <laughs> it's Correct. the US. So the Americans have created these, uh, these uh, groupings of nations like the EU and NATO to use Europe for their benefit. That's why Europe is peaceful and stable. The moment the American, uh, you could say benevolence or American power goes out from Europe, they're going to fi start fighting each other immediately. Immediately. Everybody is going to start fighting each other. So it's because of the Americans that Europe has been stable for the past 70 years. And maybe maybe not for, for too long because the Turks, they are chomping at the bit. They would like to jump into oh, Greece. Yes, yes. They want to recreate their caliphate. Yes, the caliphate. They want to create the Pan-Turan corridor. They want to wipe Armenia off the map of the world. And they want to reintegrate Azerbaijan with Turkey. And maybe parts of Greece also and take out the whole of Cyprus and then rampage across the world. Oh, well, except that they don't have the capacity. They don't have the capacity, but they have the great uh, oversized <laughs> they ambitions. They have the dreams. Yes, oversized it's dreams. Like, it's like Pakistan. Like Pakistan. That's <laughs> Gazwai thing. Hind. Yeah, that's another <laughs> thing. They want to do Gazwai Europe. The Turks. <laughs> they, they want to do Gazwai Europe. Yeah, so um, all this while, while the US was uh, thinking that they were ruling the world, there was a virus eating up uh, America from within. Yes. And that was the virus of the left. While they ended the history abroad, the history actually began within. Yes, and that seems to be something that uh, they kind of overlooked or maybe they were aware and they just wanted it to happen. So, so what happened is that uh, if you go back to the history of the US in the 1950s, uh, post Second World War. So Second World War, you had the Manhattan, nowadays there's this big movie out, Oppenheimer. So you had the Manhattan Project, uh, J, J. Robert Oppenheimer was the father of the atomic bomb. But afterwards, everything went, after, after the victory in the Second World War, they persecuted this guy because he was once a member or his brother was a member of the Communist Party of the US. You remember McCarthy? That's a McCarthy era that we're talking about. They went after anybody who was suspected to have even a pale shade of red on him. 
they went after anybody suspected of having any kind of leftist ties, <coughs> Marxist, communist ties. Communist parties are banned. In the yes, US. they are banned. But in the 1960s onwards, something happened that communists started infiltrating the US academia very, yeah. very, very subtly. And the, that was the birth of the feminist movement. And that was the later you had the, the birth of what they call uh, post modernism. Post Post Derrida and, and all these people yeah, Derrida, in France. Yeah. So all started from France. It's all started from France. Every single leftist movement in the world has started from France. The original woke movement was the French Revolution. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, when they started talking about uh, individualism, yes. that also started from France. Liberté, liberté, égalité, fraternité, all that. Yeah, individual rights, all that. So that's individual where it all rights, begins. Yeah. The, the human is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. Voltaire. Voltaire, yeah. <laughs> so the original woke, woke movement was the French Revolution and they have always exported this to other parts of the world. And this cultural Marxism, Gramsci. Oh, uh, yeah. So even though it was invented by Gramsci in Italy. Yeah. But then it flourished in France. It was, uh, yeah. It, it was modernism. Incubated in France. <laughs> incubated in France. Yes. Postmodernism, of course, took birth in France. Yes. And that Frankfurt movement. Hmm. Ah. also actually migrated to France. Yes. And from there to the US. And from then the, it went to the US yes. and the US it was incubated, nursed, nurtured and... Uh, over decades and now it like rules the universe, the academia over there. And that's what's given rise to all whatever, we, whatever symptoms we see today. Today the symptoms have run riot in the US. All kinds of... Yes, it's destroying the US military. Totally. Totally. The US military. Ha ha. It's become a laughing stock. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the standards, standards they have in the US military. First of all, if I am a soldier who goes to war, I would rather prefer if I have to kill somebody, who will be who will it be easier to kill? Men or women? Women. Not women. Physically. Women. I mean, that's a biological fact that women are physically not as strong as men. Half as strong as men, perhaps. You put a 60 kilo weight on a man and ask him to run 10 kilometers, he'll do it. He may suffer a lot, but he'll do it. You ask a woman to do it, she won't last one kilometer. Most women, some out of maybe two percent may do it. Some some are very strong, but overall, it's a biological, scientific fact that women are not as strong as men. They are not even half as strong as men. And putting women in the armed forces, especially in combat roles, that's what the Americans have been doing. And now we are also importing that nonsense over here. We are not importing. Our uh, what? judges seem to be very fond of it. I think some of the judges' daughters need to be sent to the front. Look, if you are a soldier, if you are if you are a low rank soldier, a grunt, and your combat, your, your no, commanding say officer, Indian military has uh, resisted it. I'm glad they and, have, and flatly refused to induct women in combat roles. They know yeah, how the Pakistanis are going to treat women. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, <laughs> that will give them added incentive for Ghazwayant. <laughs> I mean, w w this is nonsense, actually. You know. We can obviously have women in the armed forces in non-combat roles, of course, yes, of course, yes, yes. not in combat have, roles. Have them in air force also. You, you, you can you can fly planes. That's not uh, not over enemy territory. I would say not, because you know what can happen if you're shot down there and you survive. Uh, anyway, my my yeah. point is that if you're a soldier and your commanding officer is a woman who cannot perform, see, your commanding officer has to earn your respect, physically, mentally, in all ways. That commanding officer should be able to surpass you physically in whatever you do and set an example as to what physical standards I must have as a soldier. If your commanding officer can't do that, will your will this average soldier respect that person? They are going to laugh behind your back. That's what. And you can't have that in the army. That causes loss of cohesion, loss of morale, loss of discipline. And this is a recipe for disaster if you if you do this sort of thing, you know. So I and I in US military, you they are flaunting transgenderism. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you look at their, some of the generals and colonels wearing skirts, but who are men? What are they up to? I mean, okay, you keep it to your country, but don't try to export it to the rest of the world, you know, in, in the guise of freedom of whatever, democracy and human rights. So that's what they are doing. They have become the world's laughing stock. And uh, yeah, I wonder how they'll perform in an actual war where somebody fights back. I mean, they, 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 they are fine yes. shooting at, uh, you know, uh, guerrillas and uh, terrorists. in Afghanistan, how they ran away. I mean, a tail between their legs? No, that, that, that was a planned withdrawal, I think. The Americans decided to withdraw and hand over a hundred billion dollars of weaponry to the Taliban. See, it is alleged by Amrullah Saleh that the Americans pay the Taliban about 60 million dollars a week as a stipend or whatever you want to call it. That only causes pain to their other stooge, Pakistan. No, what that does is that it keeps the Chinese away. 
and it also keeps Pakistan at bay. So, there's a, so they are in some way retaining some geopolitical control and relevance in the region. That's what the Americans are doing. Mainly, it's about not allowing China to expand into Afghanistan. So, as long as you keep the Taliban happy and you give them whatever they want and you let them run riot and have women wear burqas and flog people, chalta hai, kar, kar, karte rao. But you take our money and you, you do what we, we tell you. That's all. The joke is that the Afghan currency is 85 to the dollar, while Pakistani currency is... 300 now? Achha. 305 to the dollar. Okay, it's crossed 300 now. Pakistan is in free fall. I, I wonder how long Pakistan yes, actually we lasts. We will discuss Pakistan also. Yeah. But uh, for the moment, let's uh, settle this US-China, USSR, conundrum. You heard Vivek Ramaswamy. Yes, I have, I've been hearing him. Yes. And um, you would also have heard about the Ukrainian war. Let's talk about the fate of the Ukrainian war, how it is going to go. And uh, you'd have heard Tucker Carlson's interview with uh, Colonel I saw some uh, of it. Douglas McGregor. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the fate of the Ukrainian war? How look, is it going to go? Look, I think it's a matter of time. Whether it happens next week, whether it happens in the next three years, the Russians are going to prevail. The Russians are, are going to get what they want. Initially, they were willing to withdraw apart from Luhansk and Donetsk everywhere else. They, were, they had advanced all the way to Kiev. In the, in the initial weeks of the war, of the war in 2022, by, by March or something, they were on the outskirts of Kiev. But then they withdrew because they were given assurances that Kiev will become neutral or whatever. And then there were obviously those assurances were just lies. The Russians simply want NATO to be out of Ukraine. They don't want NATO on their borders. That's all they want. So that's a red line that they do not want to allow anyone to cross. So they were, I think, willing to settle for a neutral Ukraine and a change of regime in Kiev, and then they would not have to continue the war. So I think now that it's very clear that the Americans are not going to stop, they're relentless, and they just want the destruction of Russia, apparently, that's what it looks like. I think eventually, at some point in time, the Russians will take Kiev, put a, put a puppet regime in place, and take some parts west of Kiev also, and then leave the rest to Poland. That's what I think will happen. It may happen maybe in a couple of months, maybe by the end of this year, maybe another three three years. The Russians have been very slow and deliberate. They have been very systematic in what they're doing. They have not tried to run rampage over the country like the Americans used to do. Shock and oh, just flatten the country and then the, send the soldiers. The Russians have not done that. So I think it's a matter of time before Russia gets what it wants in Ukraine. What they want is NATO should no longer be in a position of, of being able to control this, this slow attrition that uh, the Russians are doing, uh, it is uh, completely killing off the, not just the edge of NATO, but the basics of NATO, the basic foundation of NATO is getting disintegrated because of the slow attrition that uh, the Russians are performing. See, it's, it's disintegrating Ukraine. It's destroying their entire military the, in the mouth of the, of the meat grinder. NATO is simply sitting outside. It is using Ukraine as a proxy. They are okay with Ukraine become, being eaten up and grinded, ground down. They are fine with that. NATO is intact. Not a single NATO fo so soldier is officially on Ukrainian territory. We know some have been there and some have been killed in rocket missile uh, strikes and all that. But overall, the entire NATO machinery is outside. So, NATO is fine. NATO is being degraded. Because a lot of their ammunition, a lot of their ammunition, power, mm. that is getting destroyed in Ukraine. That is absolutely correct. Because uh, they, they are now sh facing shortages. They ran out of MLRS and all those, uh, uh, all those rockets. That's why they had to send cluster munitions, which are illegal, again, uh, under uh, what they call international law or whatever, UN law. But they sent the... So the Americans are perfectly fine with, with violating UN law and international law where it suits them. They have sent cluster munitions, cl cluster weapons, which are horrible to Ukraine. So clearly they are running out of ammunition. They don't have the capability that the Russians have. The Russians can churn out ammunition and missiles and shells and whatever else 24 by 7 by 365. The Russians have the industrial capacity for that. The Americans and the NATO countries lack that. So the, what they are doing right now is that they are using all their surplus they ammunition. run their factories. They are using all the old surplus ammunition and now they are running out of that. And uh, the Americans are not are not quite sure what to do now. Uh, Captain Colonel McGregor, uh -huh. I uh, heard him on the Tucker Carlson uh -huh. show, and he was saying that our uh, ammunition and uh, our platforms are decades old. Uh -huh. the tanks and all that, right? Everything, hmm. all platforms. So the Russian, uh, the um, the Americans, long ago used to have a hypersonic missile program. Today they are unable to to replicate the technology. They have lost 
the technology. And they've been trying to develop hypersonic strike weapons. And as far as I know, they have not succeeded. Whereas the Russians have that, the Chinese have that. I'm not sure about India, but India may also have some, something like that. The India Americans don't have it. Brahmos is hypersonic. Brahmos is not hypersonic, it's supersonic. Hypersonic means uh, Mach 5 plus or Mach 6 plus. So Brahmos is up to Mach 2. The next generation Brahmos may be a hypersonic one. It's classified, obviously. We don't know what the status is. But yeah, India may be somewhere near the technology. The Americans don't have it. So yeah, much of their weapon systems are old. Many of them could be outdated. They have not really fought a real war in decades, a war in which their opponent can actually fight back. They have been chasing Al-Qaeda and Taliban and all these ragtag groups of people who can't really fight back. They on, always go in that manner. They first flatten a country and then the soldiers and the soldiers who shoot at civilians and whatnot. So they, they think that's a great victory. But when you have an opponent who genuinely can fight back, that's something they have not faced in decades, maybe not since Vietnam. In Vietnam, they lost. In Vietnam, they lost. But they lost. even there, the power of the Vietnamese was quite asymmetrical compared to them. Yes, they used asymmetric tactics because they could not uh, face up to the standard tactics. Yeah. But one-on-one, um, -on -one, I don't think they have fought since the Second World War. Maybe not since the Second World War. That's right, yeah. And they have never faced any war on their territory except the Civil War. So they are kind of an untested military force. They, they, they are big bullies who can go and beat down the little guy. But can they really fight an opponent who is very well trained? I think they should send some of these skirt-wearing journals to face off the Russians. <laughs> they won't do that. The <laughs> Russians, you know, when the Russians go to war, initially they face catastrophic losses. It's not happened in Ukraine, but if you look at their track record, in, let's say Second World War, initially they will face disastrous losses, they'll lose loss of territory. But then they start fighting, they, then they stop, and then they start advancing. They always get better as the war progresses, the Russians. Now the Russian army is battle-hardened. They've got all their tactics and everything in order. They also have their weapons. They also have those drones, loitering drones and all that. The Iranian Shahed, the two drones they have and other things as well. And they're, they're raining havoc on the Ukrainian forces. It's, it's, a, it's a, actually a humanitarian disaster for Ukraine. The, who are fighting a war on somebody, someone else's behalf. They are fighting essentially their own people. And they have a, a president who is somebody's proxy. So, you know, they, they are being used as, 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 a, as a throwaway disposable asset. It's going to destroy the nation. Yeah, nation of about 40 million and 1.4 million. Oh, no, I think more than that. 14 million. About 14 million have um, gone abroad. I would not probably, be surprised. Yeah, probably, because probably will never come back. Because they are, they are forcibly so they've lost people. almost a third of their population. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And about 400,000 killed. Disaster. Absolute disaster for Ukraine. So it, it's not going to end well for Ukraine. So we were talking the US Army कितना पतन हो गया है और ये यूएस आर्मी तो अब किसी भी फाइटिंग फोर्स को फाइट नहीं कर सकती अनलाइक द रशियन आर्मी सो अ फाइटिंग फोर्स जो होता है दे नीड टू हैव कांस्टेंट फाइट्स टू टू टेस्ट देयर मेटल एंड टू स्टे एट द फाइटिंग फिट स्टेज यू नो स्टे इन द कर ऑफ स्टेट इफ यू आर नॉट अकस्टम्ड टू फाइटिंग दैट्स व्हाई यू नो इट्स इट्स अ it's a paradoxical thing that wars are terrible for people, but they are great for armies because they keep you fit. And it, it, they weed out the non-performers. And they, especially when you have field promotions on the battlefield, when your uh, commander dies for whatever reason, when you have to promote somebody, you're going to promote somebody who's going to be, you know, meritorious of a promotion, not some random person. So in that sort of situation, armed forces do very well if they actually come out on top. So the Americans have not really fought for decades. Maybe not since the Second World War, a proper war, you know. And uh, they, I think they, they are now kind of over-reliant on technology, uh, standoff distance strike weapons and all that. Uh, and uh, when, whenever they typically invade a country, they just flatten the country first and then they send in the soldiers. So if they have to face a real opponent in the future, I kind of fear for them, for the Americans. Especially with the entire dilution of the quality of their armed forces, with the with the entire whatever woke agenda and all that, when you when you bring ideology into the armed forces instead of iron discipline, it's gonna affect performance, it's gonna affect morale, it's gonna affect cohesion, and overall it's gonna affect res your results. So that's why they they right now use proxies, proxy nations to fight their wars. Like Ukraine is being used as a proxy. 
in the future maybe if if need comes need if there is need they may use poland as a proxy taiwan is another proxy they could use against china in the meanwhile they will take out tsmc from china from taiwan so that they won't lose the technology and all so yeah i think uh, overall the us armed forces and overall it's it's uh, it's not in very good shape they are very powerful obviously because they're the largest economy and they have nuclear weapons and all that and they control half the world but their armed forces i'm not sure if they are really capable of fighting a determined and capable opponent aapko lagta hai ki jo real difference ho gaya hai wo us economy ka jo downslide hua hai ukraine war ki wajah se दैट इज टर्निंग आउट ऑफ द रियल डिफरेंस क्योंकि अब वो इस स्थिति में पहुंच गए हैं कि अनसस्टेनेबल डेट हो गया है एवरी ईयर दे इज अ फिस्ट फाइट ऑन रेजिंग द डेट सी डेट सी लिंग एंड द डी डॉलराइजेशन प्रोसेस विच वॉज अदरवाइज काइंड ऑफ कैप्ड बट विद दिस सेंक्शन दैट दे इम्पोज ऑन रशिया almost everybody is got alarmed and everybody wants to get out of the dollar as reserve currency kyunki company ka pata ki sahab aap kiske upar sanction laga de kiski assets jo hai wo aapke dollar assets jo hai wo seize kar le so that has given a flip to on the one hand the de-dollarization process and on the other hand uh, the worsening of the us economy to wo jo hai together with loss of manufacturing capacity uh can we say ki the pax americana is finally at a dead end pax americana i think it is on the downhill slope now it is not currently at a dead end but it is going to go it's going the direction maybe in a decades time we will be in a very different uh, kind of world that we live in as a child in the 1980s i used to think well, how does america impose sanctions on nations it's some people imposing sanctions on libya on this on that har jagah sanctions ki kya hota hai sanctions later i grew up and i understood that because it's because the us dollar is a reserve currency so they can prohibit nations from doing any kind of trade with those nations otherwise you know the entire system is going to be against you and they cannot cut off cut you off from swift like they did with russia and so on so that is their great strength that the us dollar is the world's reserve currency and secondly uh, so that is now a problem because the entire world now sees what they can do at a moment's notice unki marzi ho gayi they can impose sanctions on you and cut you off from the world's economy to aap kisi ke sath trade nahi kar payenge aapko import export karna hai kuch nahi hoga aapka petroleum imports band ho jayega aapka food imports band ho jayega aapko kuch bechna aap nahi kar paoge it's going to destroy your economy they can easily destroy economies like this so everybody realizes that they are vulnerable everybody knows that they can be destroyed by the americans at a moment's notice so abhi recently india bought uh, A lot of significant consignment of oil from the UAE with Indian rupees. Uh, Saudi Arabia and China are doing a yuan trade. Other countries are also looking at other options. India का UPI भी जा रहा है तो अलग-अलग जगह पर. Uh, I think twenty uh, six countries. Twenty six no? countries soon fifty. Uh, ये चल रहा है. अब बात हो रही है BRICS करंसी की. Maybe it's a pre- little premature because India said no. But yes. Every nation. Well, in the joint statement, it was very much there, say okay. there. So we can't say that India said. So that. India is kind of you know that they have given, set up a group to study all this. So India is kind of you know giving mixed signals. Doctor Jashankar clearly said that it is uh, not the right time to talk about a BRICS, BRICS currency. But but, then but it's the they, part of the joint segment as well. Part of the so joint. So we are giving mixed mixed signals, maybe by design, maybe by purpose. We don't want to the world to know what our next steps are going to be like. So keep it. Vig. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's a very good thing. So India is is playing the game the way it should be played. So definitely every major country wants to get out of the out of the dollar trap. And if that happens, this enormous debt. See, American debt. Kya hai? They print treasury bonds. Ki bhai ye kagaz ka tukda lo. It is worth let's say hundred dollars. You you buy it for a hundred dollars and you hold it as an investment. In the future, when the dollar appreciates, you can sell it sell it back to us and you will get a hundred and eight dollars or whatever. So you're gonna make an in, uh, make it make a profit. So that's why countries and people, individuals, is to buy U.S. Treasury bonds. And so when you let's say I buy a hundred U.S. Treasury bonds, the U.S. owes me debt. So that is what we mean by U.S. debt. Internal debt also happens. It's all different. But overall, globally, this means the U.S. debt. Cap. So China holds, uh, I don't know. Close to a trillion dollars of of U.S. Treasury bonds, maybe more, maybe less. They have diluted it. They've, di- they've been diluted in the past. At one time, they used to hold nearly two trillion dollars. Two, three trillion. One point four trillion dollars. Sorry. Yes, and now it is below one trillion, if I am not mistaken. Yeah. So they have been divesting those assets. So that is the U.S. debt. So it means that if in the future China says that I own, I own these many treasuries, 
I'm going to send it back to you, give me the money. It means the US has to give the money back. Lekin, because the US dollar was the global currency, reserve currency, it meant they could just print the paper money dollars and give it to China. Paper print karke de do. To print a hundred dollar bill, it costs about one cent or so. Or three 17 cents. cents. 17 cents. Thik. China came out with the paper. Ah. So, so that the hundred dollar bill costs 17, 17 cents. cents and print. we have to give in return one hundred dollar worth of real goods and services. That's how the US owns the world. And that means that the US debt is just paper. Unless the US dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency, in which case the US is royally in trouble. Because then they will have to actually give back real money and real value. So that's why it, from the US perspective, it is non-negotiable. You cannot, pre you cannot allow anybody to, you cannot allow the world to slip out of, of, the, grasp, of the grasp of the US dollar. So that is what the US want, doesn't want to allow the world to do. And that's what the world wants to do. De-dollarize, get out of the US uh, control. So that is the tug of war right now. And eventually, it's all about balance of power. But even in the US now, their noise is that this is becoming unsustainable and uh, we have to get out of this. So having a single reserve currency is not good. Even George Soros said that, you know, can you imagine? The biggest defender of the system. Hmm. So yeah, I think it's right now it's unclear as to what the US wants. But from my perspective, it is a catastrophe for them if they stop. I mean, if, if the world... Of course, it won't happen suddenly. It will happen gradually if it happens. I think it will happen eventually. It won't happen. So maybe by the end of this decade, you may be, maybe in a very different kind of system. Maybe two currencies or if there's a BRICS currency or whatever. If BRICS actually becomes a viable force, which maybe it, it, it may not become because maybe BRICS is doomed. That's a whole uh, other thing, you know. But then a lot of multilateral. Uh, multipolar world right now. Multipolar world, multilateral systems, yes. multilateral exchanges yes, yes. of currency. Yeah. That will... Uh, dethrone the US dollar. Hopefully it will because it's 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 way past time that happens because you, you cannot be under the, in a single hegemon's boot for so many decades. That's how the world has been. And we don't realize that they, we, we Hollywood tells us the Americans are always the good guys. But if you look at their actual track record over the world, it, it's not been a good force. It's, they have not been a force for good in the world. You know, that's right. Yeah. In, even if you look at the, their history. Yes. They started uh, out by slaughtering the natives. They stole an entire continent. From the natives. They wiped out the natives, they settled their settler colonialism, and then they used another race of people, the, the African people, to build their economy. So their entire nation is built on the genocide of one people and the slavery of another people. And today they talk about human rights and whatnot. Until recently, they had segregation. Until recently, human rights is just a re regime change tactic. You know, yeah, it's a regime change, uh, change tactic. After the In the aftermath of the, of the Second World War, the Americans and the British came up with what they call the Atlantic Charter, which means if you read that, it is a set of uh, rules or conditions or, or principles by which the world should be governed, in which they prioritize democracy and human rights. But democracy for them is just a means of controlling other countries. So you, you have, let's say, dictated, you have a regime that is not very pro-American. You say they are dictators, they're evil. You go and smash them, then you install a puppet, you say that this is democracy. And now the world is good. They can do whatever they want. You and at that time, they uh, told all the um, non-Western countries, basically non-white countries, that uh, in order to grow, they have to sacrifice their culture. Yes, yes. Culture has to be sacrificed. Yes. But in 2013, they say that the growth has to include culture. So <laughs> they have come. It's whims and fancies. It's the whims-based world order. It's not the rules-based world order. Who writes international law? Where can I get a document which has the international law? What is international law? It is whatever they feel it is. There is no such thing as international law. Okay, there are some things in the UN Charter and all that which could be construed as international law. But there is no one book or document that I can procure, order from wherever and per law, international law, this is international law. It's not like So international law is whatever they feel it is. To next week it may change because now they can use cluster munitions. Until last week it was not allowed. It was, it was, a, it was a, what was the crime? You know, it was a, it, it was a war crime war using crime. cluster munitions. War crime. And but Putin, now they can do Putin it. Putin is a war criminal, huh. but Joe Biden is not. But Joe Biden is, is now using cluster munitions. That's fine. He's doing it Zelensky, for the right purpose. Zelensky is not. Zelensky is a hero. He's a hero. <laughs> uh, let's come to Indian position in this entire circle of international relations. Now, you think Modi has navigated this very well because... Uh, 
you remember in 2013 when modi was first projected as the prime ministerial candidate for the bjp a lot of people said that well this guy doesn't have any experience of international relations he would be disaster he won't be able to handle the international relations part of it and our relations would be spoiled so um, 10 years down the line almost 10 years down the line what do you think well if you look at the global perspective perception of mr modi they look upon him as one of the geopolitical grandmasters one of the guys who knows the game in and out and i yeah it, this this uh, sentiment was being aired in the media that mr modi if he becomes prime minister he won't be able to handle geopolitics because he has no experience well by the way he was friends with mr shinzo abe when he was chief minister he was doing you know he he did visit japan on at least a couple of occasions to further the trade relations between japan and the state of gujarat which will obviously help india he uh, used to uh, you know handle foreign delegations who would come to gujarat for investment so he had a lot of experience dealing with foreign delegations and doing diplomacy at a certain scale and at a certain level a lot of international diplomacy is business diplomacy it's business Actually. diplomacy yes yeah so mr and modi if you know how to deal with the deep state then you know almost all of international diplomacy because international diplomacy is mostly dictated by the global deep state right so mr modi once he became prime minister he kind of hit the ground running he went to various multilateral uh, events and he was perfectly at home in all these things and if if you see his first term i would say without any disrespect to any other politician Or, or other minister that he actually was the de facto foreign minister of India. He was going to all the nations and doing the diplomacy, which typically you would have Dr. Jai Shankar doing today. So he was doing it very well. He he was going everywhere. Today he doesn't travel that much because Dr. Jai Shankar is is, is traveling everywhere. He's taken the burden. But then in the first time he was doing that, and he did a very good job of it. So I think there is no question about Mr. Modi's geopolitical and diplomatic abilities. He is a grand master at that. He is one of the best in the world at this. so india has done very well thanks to you know to, to a large extent to to mr modi himself and his tireless work ethic and going around the world furthering india's interest and in, in, uh, establishing ties and and, and 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 you know making the ties stronger and better he i mean after mr modi came to power india has established such incredibly close and warm relations with various uh, middle eastern countries saudi arabia uae etc which wasn't the case before right these are very close allies of india today you could say that way so that's that is ring fenced pakistan that's totally checkmated pakistan because that was pakistan's great uh, you know pressure outlet valve but now it's no longer there so that's what mr modi has achieved through his uh, one could say masterful diplomacy and geo geopolitical acumen as to the complete clarity as to where india's interests lie and which nations Uh, their interests align with ours and let's go and talk to them and and proceed in a mutually beneficial fashion and once you do that when once a nation of india's stature and 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 uh, and magnitude wants to come along with a certain nation they will be happy to do it so india has done this very well mr modi has done it very well i think overall india is still not a great power india is an aspiring great power we i i you know the chinese never use the word superpower it's only indians who want to be vishwaguru in superpower first learn to walk properly then learn to jog then we'll th think of running sprinting and maybe one day we'll fly yeah so i i think we should not we, we should take our eyes off the superpower status india is all obsessed with status 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 superpower status forget about status focus on the basics uh, india is in, india's economy is doing well 3 and a half 3.8 trillion dollars now maybe uh, in a, by 26 india will be the third largest economy in the world but we will not be counted as a great power until we reach 10 trillion dollars or so and uh, for comparison china is about six times our size they have had a head start they are also a dictatorship a one party state which means things can proceed very fast plus we don't know what their actual gdp is we don't know the actual gdp is much of it is definitely fudged <laughs> for sure they have been inflating their gdp no doubt no doubt but they are still way bigger their, their gdp before corona was 14 million trillion dollars and now it is 18 uh, 18 19 trillion dollars yeah that's that's a bit of a how, how does stretch. it happen that's a bit of a stretch <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we have to understand that china is not all it seems it's not as big the dragon as it seems to be it may be more of a lizard but okay but we still cannot you know 
uh, can't discount the danger it poses. China is nobody's friend. China is absolutely nobody's friend. I mean, I talk about these things on my channel and I get lots of, lots of Chinese viewers who come and say that you Indians, uh, you are blaming everything on China. China is the world's friend. China is the leader of the global south. What leader of the global south? China is trying to position itself now, now of late, as the leader of the global south. Until two, three years ago, they were positioning themselves as the, as the challenger to the US. <laughs> now they want to act, be the leader of the global with, south. With the global south, it acts uh, like that wily old uh, Sahukar. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the deal with China. Uh, now they're positioning, they're repositioning themselves as the friend and the leader of the global south. And that is something where India and China are again clashing. Because India is actually positioning itself as the leader of the global south. China did not help anybody when there was COVID. India sent millions of vaccine doses for free, vaccine maitri, to every country that needed it without charging a single rupee in exchange. We did that. That is genuine friendship. That is genuine leadership. We are giving away India stack, India DPI for free to anybody who wants it. We're not charging money for that also. And it will really transform nations that really need a transformation. It will you know, promote social inclusion. It will promote financial inclusion. It will cut out a lot of corruption. Lots of nations in Africa need something like India stack, India DPI. And we are offering it to anybody who wants it. We will not charge a single rupee. India is genuinely taking the leadership of the global south. And that's what China is very unhappy about. They want to say we are the leaders of the, of the China world. China doesn't give even concessional loans to anybody. They, they, they give commercial loans only. They spring dead traps. They have learned from the IMF and the World Bank. They have learned from the best. The IMF and the World Bank are dead trap inducing mechanisms. They are the machines. They give concessional loans. Hmm. IMF and World Bank, they are giving concessional loans. They also they create maximum, traps. The See, maximum interest rate that the World Bank or the IMF charges is 1.5%. But And the minimum that China charges or the, the Chinese Exim Bank charges is 4%. But when it comes to the IMF and the, and the World Bank, they will give you money and maybe a concessional rate of, you know, uh, but they will tell you how to use the money and how not to use the money. Yes, a lot of conditions. Lots of conditions. That that's how India was compromised in the 1990s. Because the big daddy Russia was, USSR was gone and our politicians needed a new big daddy and IMF and World Bank loans came in and they told us how to do things and what to do, how to open up our economy and that's how we were compromised politically in other, in other ways in the 1990s. And that's why there is so much US influence within India today at various levels. It all started in the 1990s. So the IMF and the, and the World Bank do it in a different way. They compromise entire nations, they riddle them deep inside. The Chinese, they spring dead traps. And they that, that that's also another way of starting to own a nation. Like if the Sri Lankans can't pay back the loan for Hamban Dutta, Chinese own Hamban Dutta now. And they do that in various African nations. They start owning mines and resources and all that. That is exploitation, that's colonization. India doesn't do that. So, but India doesn't have the kind of money today that the Chinese have. So that's why China is kind of attractive, especially to dictators and all that. But the uh, BRI loans... Most of them are under default. <laughs> yeah, the, so in BRI loans and the China-Pakistan economic corridor, it's all defunct now. It's not, nothing is happening. What did Pakistan get out of it? What did, what did even China get out of it? So when it comes to China, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of hot air, but it doesn't really deliver, you know, and that's the problem with China. The Chinese are, so the Chinese now are trying to claim leadership of the global south. India is actually taking leadership to some extent of the global south. And there is this new tug of war that's emerging between India and China in, 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 this, in this domain, in this sphere, leadership of the global south. So China wants to uh, disregard the G20. We will no longer attend G20 meetings. We will only focus on BRICS and whatever, you know, uh, is good for us, whatever is beneficial for us. He's not coming to ASEAN also. He's Jinping. not coming. To, he is not in ASEAN. He's not coming to Delhi also this weekend. Right, Xi Jinping. Putin is, Putin is already out for obvious reasons. He, can't, he cannot really travel internationally right now. So Xi Jinping... There are a couple of reasons why he would not come to India for the G20 thing. First of all, there are the India-China tensions. I mean, they are claiming Indian territory. The recent map again. Did you did you see the recent map? Yes. They are ch they are claiming the the Osuri River clash territory again. I know the the, <laughs> the Bear Island, the Black Bear Island, whatever it's called. <laughs> they, they are claiming that island. Yes. And um, they are claiming Senkaku, is Japan. Yes. Yes. And of course, Taiwan is their own. Plus, they have uh, reintroduced the nine dash line. Nine dash line, of course. So, um, they, I think, with this one stroke of uh, brush, they have uh, got about nine countries against them. Yeah. So, they clearly don't want peace. 
they clearly don't want to be a friend of anyone they don't want good relations with anybody they want tensions all around their international border what sort of nation does this i mean they are I mean, looking if you their look own at view. their history yeah that uh, middle kingdom syndrome did it do them any good <laughs> Well, if you look at Chinese history, it's a disaster. I mean, you know what it takes to in, what, you know what it takes to conquer China. Historically, it takes three guys on a, on horseback <laughs> to conquer China, as the Mongolians did. <laughs> Chinggis, Shri Chinggis Khan. China has never ever won a war in which it has to fight on its own territory. They always lose, and they typically lose to ragtag uh, nomads. Okay, mm -hmm. so China is good as a bully. Then they build large walls. The, uh, to, the, that wall is in, in the heart of China today. So that is the real extent <laughs> of China. That's where China's border actually should lie, the wall of China. So that's the deal with China. So we have to understand we should not give in to any kind of bullying from and China. Even Manchuria was not there. Manchuria is not Chinese, no way. No way. It's just, it should be a separate country. It should be a separate country, absolutely. Manchuria, Manchuria should. Manchuria, Tibet. Inner Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, East Turkestan, Yunnan is Thai. It's not Chinese. Yunnan is Thai. The Thai people live there, not the Chinese. Thai means Thai, Thai, whatever. They are genetically related to the Ahom people, the Thai. So Yunnan is not Chinese. Manchuria is not Chinese. Uh, Inner Mongolia is stolen from Mongolia. East Turkestan is not Chinese. Tibet is not Chinese. Kya bacha? What are the chances of a Sino-Indian war? I think the Chinese are non-zero and maybe from a scale for, of 1 to 10, maybe 4 or 5, I, I would say. Because the Chinese clearly don't want any peace with India. They want India on the back foot. They will always be gouging and calibrating where, where India's capabilities lie. They clearly see that India is on the upswing. India's economy is not going to stop growing for the next decade at least. And if India's economy is allowed to grow at whatever rate it is growing for the next decade, India is going to become a genuine peer competitor for China. Right now, there's only one nation in Asia that the Chinese fear, that's India, apart from the, the Asiatic part of Russia. So China, actually, if you look at it from their perspective, they are hemmed in between two great major powers. One is Asiatic Russia. The other is India in the south. And India has cultural warmth among lots of nations, especially in Eastern Asia. Nobody sees India negatively in Eastern Asia. Even Indonesia, Malaysia, most of them wouldn't. Indonesia definitely has very good uh, relations with India. Malaysia, maybe not so much. But overall, up to Japan, everybody sees India favorably. Nobody sees China favorably. So there is a great deal of hostility to China. So China would not want India to have unimpeded growth for the next 10 years. And, and if they don't do anything to stop it, India is going to grow. And then it's going to be a genuine, much more magnified threat for China. So maybe it makes sense for them to have a war with India and try to humiliate India from their perspective. But that time is now. That time is actually now. Because if you wait, the longer you wait, the, the more difficult it becomes. And China also is in entering essentially an irreversible period of demographic decline. Not decline, disaster. Their one-child policy has now caused a demographic disaster. By 2100, their population will be half of what it is. The, the demographics are going to be a disaster of all elderly people. Who will fight? Who's going to man the artillery and the tanks and the fighter planes and, and, the, and, the, and the aircraft carriers and the submarines? So if they want to fight, the time is actually now. In the next 20 years, they're going to be a nation of old people. So I think the chances are kind of... From a, on a scale of 1 to 10, maybe 4 or 5. And maybe it will happen before 24, before the 24 elections perhaps. Because if they in some way humiliate India in some way, then they then there could be sentiment against the Prime Minister in India that you have led us to a defeat from, with China. And there could be a regime change and that could benefit China. But that because window is gone. Window maybe until 24 is there from their perspective perhaps. No, look at the uh, conditions, the geographical conditions. Uh, you can fight a war only till about... Uh, Winter is coming. Only till about October, in yeah, Tibet. Yeah. Beyond October, you cannot fight a war in Tibet. Especially with a conscript army. Yes, yes. Winter is coming and winter is terrible for... You, and you can't fight. Uh, then it lasts till about um, April. Then the next window you get is only in May, June. By that time, the election would be over. Yes, they seem to so have I lost. They have, they, have, they have lost that option. They, lost, they seem to have lost the window, yes. They have lost the window. But still, even if the elections happen... And, and there is so much of mobilization of Indian troops. Hmm. They really fear the Indian troops. Oh, you go there, you will see BRO is working day and night. Bro is working day and night. You will see tanks on the roads. 
and stuff. And um, after the reverses they suffered in Galwan, they are not going to risk, and, and in Tangse in, in Arunachal recently, they are not going to risk a direct confrontation that easily. That is one. And the second is, the normal Chinese soldier is actually much inferior to a Pakistani soldier. And Indians are trained to fight Pakistan first. And uh, when they can take on the Pakistani soldier and defeat them, the Chinese soldier doesn't come that all that strong. Mountain warfare is about man-to-man -man fighting. Usme the quality of the man matters a lot. Kitna strength hai, kitna agility hai, kitna endurance hai. Man-to-man -man fighting is a whole different story than uh, other kinds of warfare. So definitely China is inferior to us in that. Uh, so yeah, if you... I think we have to thank Pakistan for keeping us tight. Yeah, we will thank On them. the LOC. Due thanks given to Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you have Pakistan. Pakistan is Pakistan is, is becoming increasingly irrelevant and a non-entity. It's a matter of time before they disintegrate. Abhi aap dekhi, there are parts of Pakistan that are no longer in Pakistani control, in the army's control. The army is what owns the nation in other nations. Nations have the army in Pakistan, as we know. The nation, the army has a nation. And I think there are parts of Balochistan, parts of Northwest Frontier Province, etc., where the army is no longer in control. You have the Tehrik Taliban Pakistan, in, which is in control of parts of um, Khyber Pakhtunwa. And the Baloch Liberation Army is in, is in control of parts of Balochistan. They are attacking uh, Pakistani soldiers, taking them uh, captive, uh, attacking Chinese uh, convoys and, uh, and Chinese engineers. It's happening. You have the entire hostile northern border with Afghanistan. The Taliban hate Pakistan. When the Taliban took over Afghanistan in 2021, it was imagined that the ISI has won. And they have gained the strategic uh, strategic depth they wanted. The <laughs> exact opposite has happened. Pakistan has lost all control of Afghanistan. And, Nothing. And Taliban have got strategic depth. Yes, yes. <laughs> the Taliban have strategic depth not only in Pakistan but also in Iran, westwards. The situation is <laughs> so it's a nightmare situation for Pakistan. The Iranians don't like them. Indians don't like them. Afghans don't like them. Who likes them? Even the Chinese don't like them. Yeah, yes, even the Chinese don't like them. The Chinese don't like Pakistan, actually. They, they just use them as a, as a proxy, that's all. Because it's convenient to do that. Because they want to, to have this hostile labor on India's western border. So Pakistan, I think it's a matter of time before it disintegrates. Um, there are so many issues in Pakistan. I mean, the exchange rate with the dollar, as, we, as you just referred to, it's gone beyond 300 rupees per dollar, right? Pakistani rupees. Yes. So there, is, there, there are shortages of everything in Pakistan. <laughs> Afghanistan is 85. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, what is the currency? Afghani. Afghani. That's a disaster for Pakistan. I mean, uh, and they have shortages of the most basic things like atta vata and all that. Electricity shortages, obviously, what is it? And yeah, the people are not happy. If you look at the, the situation in Gilgit, Pakistan, Pakistan occupied Jammu Kashmir, they want to reintegrate these areas with India. They want to be back with India, you know, because they can see what's happening right across the border. Everything is available. You go to Thang village in Gilgit, Indian Gilgit, Pakistan, you see opposite, kya situation hai? there's nothing there. And over here, there is electricity, there is happiness, there are people smiling and dancing and laughing. On the other side, there is a disaster zone. So they can see the Gilgit Pakistanis and the Pakistani occupied Kashmiris, how good the situation is in, on the Indian side. And they must be asking themselves, why don't we also have that? So there is a sentiment of, of reunification from, from these people. So I think eventually it's going to happen, maybe the next three years, maybe five years. I think it, it could it's happen. It's a question of time. It's, it's a question not, of time. It's the not, not the question of uh, whether it is going to happen. No, it's, it's a, a question, question of, of when it is going to happen. Yes. That is, that is definitely there. So I think Pakistan, uh, we can discount as a threat. It's not a threat. And therefore, we can discount the two-front war also as a threat. Oh, ah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look, if there's a war, and it's a two-front war, I think without going nuclear, we can deal with the Pakistani threat in about five minutes. This, it just takes one proper targeted One strike. proper threat and they released Avinandan. Uh, that, that sort of thing also. And we also have, we know exactly where their military installations, everything is. And we have the missiles. We can pinpoint, uh, target everything and take it out. And as long as it won't go nuclear, it's fine. You know. So I think Pakistan is not something we should be too worried about. Obviously, And even their nuclear assets are probably not under their control. Probably not. Probably not. Yes. Maybe Chinese control, maybe US control. Maybe not Chinese anymore. Because there was a coup in which Imran Khan was ousted and the US has taken firm control of Pakistan once again. 
So the Americans want to use, keep Pakistan as an asset. So it's essentially up yeah, to America. Yeah, to keep yeah. fingering India. Some, fingering some India, time. Iran also, Iran also. And also keep an eye on the, on the Afghans. So it serves multiple purposes. The Americans always have multiple assets deployed in various places. The Taliban are on their payroll. The Pakistan army and IS are also on their payroll. Even though they hate each other, they will both serve different purposes for the Americans. So that's the kind of game they are playing. So that finally brings us to the point of India and the West. And India and the West, frenemies? Frenemies, yes. So yeah, see the West knows that India is the next big deal. They were, everyone was talking... In the, in the first two decades of this century, everyone was talking about the Chinese century. Then they started saying Asian century. But now it is getting becoming increasingly clear this is the Indian century. As long as India does not get embroiled in a... And now Bharatiya century. Bharatiya century. <laughs> yes, Bharatiya century. <laughs> so as long as Bharat does not get embroiled in some major war for the next 10, 15, let's say, let's ideally 20 years, then nobody will be able to stop India. So it's up to India to, to walk the tightrope, do the tightrope walking act and make sure that there are no major conflicts and you just keep growing, growing, focus on the economy. But then neither, neither the Chinese want it nor the West wants it. The Americans, they, they keep uh, triggering India's internal security situations. Exactly. There are so many things happening. There is, uh, well, there are various soft separatist uh, uh, sentiments in various parts of India. There is the situation in Manipur, which is a geopolitical issue. People don't realize it. It's purely geopolitical and, uh, and the roots lie far away from India. Uh, the the, the uh, triggering actions and all that. So they do that, of course. They don't want India to rise too much. They want India to be just strong enough to counterbalance China, but not more. They don't want to create a new China. And the situation is that India is not rising because the Americans are aiding and abetting our rise. We are rising on our own. When it came to China, they rose because of US help. The US outsourced all their manufacturing to China. And that's why China became a major economic power. India is doing it in a whole different way. Of course, we will need the help of other nations and cooperation and collaboration with various nations. So that's the thing. So the West wants to use India as a counterweight to China, but doesn't want India to rise too much. So it's a very, very, very dicey, tricky kind of situation. It's a geopolitical tightrope walking act that Mr. Modi is doing. If we do it well, we'll be fine. And this Ukrainian conflict has actually come as a blessing in disguise for India? Well, it allowed us to buy very significant quantities of very cheap Russian oil. It made India a major geopolitical player in a very short amount of time because uh, we were equidistant from Russia and the West and from maybe to some extent China as well. And overall, it's increased India's stature. India really matters now. And India, uh, the world can now see, is, is in a very strategic region of the world. If you look at, at India's geopolitical, geographical location, it's a God-given location. We are in the center of the old world. That's where we are. And our economy is rising. We managed COVID so well. Every other nation fudged it and it was a disaster. We did the best job with COVID. So because of the way we managed COVID and the way we have played uh, our cards in the Ukraine crisis also, we have in the last two, three years become one of the major geopolitical players in the world. And now we are taking the leadership of the global south and all that. It all comes out of the aftermath of the uh, Russian special military operation of February 24, 2022. So yeah, it's really transformed the way the world looks at India now. India is a major player and it's not just a status, it actually is a major player now. We actually can influence the course of world affairs the, the, as we stand, where we stand today. And um, of course, the Indian economy is a big deal these days. India is rising, the economy is rising. It's around, like even... Um, mm, the usual doubters, you know, the doubting Thomases, even they are coming out with encomiums for India, for Modi, and even people like, you know, the habitual India beaters like New York Times and Washington Post, even they are acknowledging that, okay, Modi is going to win and India is going to go big. The government did a lot of hard Today, work. Morgan Stanley came out with the... Mm -hmm. uh, an, an analysis of 2024 elections. Okay. What are they saying? Modi is going to win. Right. So And various factors, including economy. Economy is a major factor. Inclusion, social in inclusion, economic inclusion, which has all come from the India stack and all that. Uh, the Jandan uh, Yojana, uh, 
electricity for all, toilets for all. I mean, these things sound very basic and mundane, but that has really transformed lives. And it's made people feel that for the first time in 70 years, the government cares for them. And all this hard work has been done in the past seven, eight, nine years. All the all the uh, non-performing public sector units, they have been all, all transformed. I mean, all, all of that has been taken care of. All the... Air in India. Air India has been yeah privatized. That is, so that much is one has of the great, great success experience. story of privatization. Nobody believed that Air India could be privatized, but it was done. It was done. So all of this, all the hard yards have been put in. In spite of Subramaniam Swami's threats. <laughs> right. So yeah. So the government has put in all the hard yards, and now, now India could be on the verge of a significant takeoff from where we are right now. So, yeah, the, the future is, this, this is the Indian century, actually. And lots of people are still... Bharatiya century. Bharatiya century. <laughs> lots of people are still loath to say it, especially in the West, even lots of people in India. But there's no doubting it anymore. As long as there is no major conflict for the next 10 years at least, it's going to be the Bharatiya century. And recently, we have also seen uh, India's race to space. Then uh, there is also the question of... Uh, uh, nuclear race and there's also the question of uh, quantum computing race. So where do you see India in this? I think India can do a lot better in the space race. There is a new space race. See, the, the, there was a Cold War 1.0 in the 20th century and there was a space race 1.0 at the same time. Now we are in, in the middle of Cold War 2.0. And we are seeing the emergence of the new space race, especially the rush to get to the moon. Just today morning, the Japanese launched a spacecraft that should that, that they hope will land on the moon, making Japan the fifth country to land on the moon. Just a couple of weeks after India landed the Chandrayaan-3 on the moon. So everybody is rushing to the moon. Everybody wants to get to the moon. There are reasons for it and there are economic and geopolitical reasons for it. Right now, the next big nuclear technology is nuclear fusion reactors. We may be a decade or two away from a proper, full, fully functioning, um, controllable fusion reactor. But once we have fusion reactors, the technology will, will get there. So when we have fusion reactors, one of the best fuels for these reactors is an isotope of helium called helium-3. And this isotope of helium is extremely rare on Earth, but it's most likely found in great abundance in the lunar topsoil, the regolith of the moon, because of the interaction of the lunar surface with the solar wind and so on. I'll not get into, phys into the physics of that, but it's available in abundance. So, once you have fusion reactors on Earth, why not get that helium-3 from the moon and power that reactor? Because fusion reactions are way more uh, energetic and, and way cleaner than fission reactions that we have in nuclear reactors today. So one fusion reactor can essentially power a whole city. One Maybe one kilo of, of helium-3 can power a whole city for a year. That sort of thing. You know, I'm, I'm just giving you a rough estimate. So that's why helium-3 is going to be an extremely precious resource. And there's much more on the moon. Lots of other minerals and all that. I know it's a horrible idea to go to the moon and start exploiting it for resources. But it's going to happen. That is the, simply the nature of humanity. We go and exploit and when we extract resources. So it's going to happen. And the first mover advantage comes in over here. The first three, four countries that, that land on the moon and establish a permanent presence on the moon will eventually at the first opportunity start claiming territory on the moon, exclusive zones of, of economic influence and all that. And the ones who don't do it will be left out. So the three or four nations, and then there is Mars also, there is asteroid mining, which I'll not get into. So the space race is not just something for scientific curiosity. It's going to have very tangible and very rewarding economic benefits and geopolitical um, outcomes as well. So the three or four nations that will lead the, na the world in the space race in the 20th, 21st century are the three or four nations that will decide the future of humanity. So I think India is kind of not really pressing the pedal to the metal right now. We have a great mission, Chandrayaan-3, which will hopefully reawaken in a couple of weeks' time. We have the Aditya uh, L1 mission also that's going to the uh, to the L1 uh, Lagrange point around the uh, between the Earth and the Sun. But we need to have a sustained long-term focus on the moon. That's where we should focus. We should, we should aim to, we should aim, we should have create a program in such a way that Chandrayaan 10, 10 should land Indians on the moon by 2035. Chandrayaan 10. So we need to have that step-by-step -step progression of Chandrayaan missions that will eventually culminate in Chandrayaan 10 landing Indians on the moon. And then by 2040, we should have a permanent Indian presence on the moon, either a robotic station or a lunar outpost with a couple of people there. 
and we need to have obviously we need to invest in technologies like reusable rocket technology um, and we need to have uh, we need to have a space station around the earth we need to obviously have the human space flight program we need to do this it's not a waste of money lots of people say why are you wasting money on this we have poverty every nation has poverty the chinese had poverty in the 20th century but they built a very uh, very impressive space program and they are benefiting the real, you know they are reaping the rewards of that so india see in 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 20 years our descendants should not say that why did our people not invest in this 20 years ago we should have all the options o available to us in in by, by by 2040 so we need to invest in that right now we need to invest more in space space is the future space is geopolitically crucial economically crucial also it's going to open up lots of economic outcomes for the countries that have access to space space exploration so i think space is very important india has the ability india is the one of the four nations in the entire world that can land soft land a spacecraft on the moon that's a huge amount of technological advancement and maturity we need to leverage that and take it further so what i'm saying is isro needs more funding isro needs way more funding than what it's getting today that's number one when it comes to artificial intelligence and quantum computing ai what is ai ai is a bunch of statistical equations ai it's, it's al advanced algorithms advanced algorithms that's what it is so why has there suddenly been why have we suddenly seen this ai revolution why did we have always had that no in that sense no 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 ai in the sense that okay the, your uh, uh, for instance your mobile can sense your priorities and what kind of in in the spell check yeah uh, but they can put forward the, the correct spellings as you type or uh, for instance uh, youtube can uh, recommend to you the kind of videos that you prefer watching those are but what's happened have recently always been there but what's happened recently is an explosion <laughs> in the in the in the capabilities like it can now output it can at a given command it can output a 300 page book which is written so well you you can't tell a non human machine has written it secondly you have generative ai not just text but also uh, it can also generate uh, images extremely high quality images i mean like in the style of picasso in the style of whatever you know you can do that artwork of any size on any any scale it can generate music good sounding music it can also now it has already started venturing into generating video very soon all the video creators and music creators and painters and artists will go out of work possibly because of ai because you have this proliferation now how did this happen not the youtubers i hope hopefully not <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not so the question is how did this happen there is there has been a perfect storm a perfect <laughs> combination of two things gigantic data sets and computing power we already we had computing power but not the kind of computing power we now have which is gpus graphical processing units that that are in a, you know a quantum leap in the amount of computing power that is that is available at your disposal so what you do is you take entire rooms fill them, fill them with the racks of computers with these uh, you know high end gpus you you put them together and then you put them at work and that's how it's able to crunch through enormous voluminous quantities of data and that's why this perfect storm has happened huge amounts of data and extremely advanced computing power that came together and that's why we have the, uh, the explosion of ai that we have today in the past ai was very basic like predictive predictive machines you type something it's going to finish that for you and all it was very basic stuff today what we have is a whole different magnitude of ai now that is something that see any new technology that emerges is always first utilized by governments and the military and in 20 30 years when it becomes very mundane then it is allowed to trickle down into the public domain into the civilian domain so india where is india in ai i think india is not very far behind in ai obviously we don't have indian ai companies that give a product for the for the public but the government is a whole different beast the government is sitting on an enormous quantity of data which is the india stack the aadhaar database and all that we have data like nobody else has and uh, we also have computing power and all that so i think india may not be very far behind when it comes to ai especially from the perspective of the government and the military perhaps so i think india may be doing well in ai when it comes to quantum computing we are 
possibly nowhere in quantum computing because quantum computing is a whole different kind of computer it's not a von neumann machine like we have in tra traditional computer science it's a whole different beast it's a, it's not about ones and zeros it's about superposition of, of ones and zeros that you have in in this uh, in this quantum spaces uh, you have iron traps and you have entangled atoms and molecules and all that i'll not get into the physics of it but it's it's a whole different beast and quantum computing can crack your encryption algorithms when you have a proper functioning quantum computer it can crack the best uh, encryption algorithms on the fly through just brute force attacks and it can brute force anything because of the fact that it doesn't deal with only ones and zeros it deals with entire superpositions of ones and zeros so it deals with multi dimensional uh, you know spaces abstract spaces and it can compute in that and, uh, and there are a couple of nations that have claimed quantum supremacy which means that in case in the case of certain computations they can outperform a regular the most powerful supercomputer that you have just a basic quantum computer so there are certain uh, calculations and computations that would take a regular computer no matter how much ram you give it it will take it thousands of years maybe millions of years but a quantum computer can do it in seconds maybe minutes so that's the kind of leap and uh, advancement quantum computers can give you and the us claims to have achieved quantum supremacy the chinese claim to have achieved quantum supremacy india is not making is not doing quantum computers we have the indian institute of science which has some of the most advanced quantum technology experiments in the world but not quantum computing we need to it's it's nice to do things for scientific curiosity and obviously they will have economic outcomes eventually but we need to definitely focus on quantum computing so we need to have at least two, two or three centers in india maybe iits universities whatever where they go after this technology of creating a quantum computer and and controlling the 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 states of the of the atoms or molecules inside and using them to to do computations it has to start with baby steps first create an ion trap in a, in a good vacuum and, and and you keep those atoms or molecules there then you put, put entangle them put them in superpositions and start doing stuff with them use use quantum algorithms so all that stuff needs to start happening i don't think we are close to being there right now so that is one thing that disappoints me ai i hope we are we are doing well space we are doing well we need more funding quantum computing we are right now possibly nowhere and that is very disappointing and we have the ability the wherewithal the talent the infrastructure the funding the money resources available to make this happen but maybe the vision may be uh, lacking are we concentrating on nuclear power generation nuclear power generation is something that we really need to focus on uh i think the nuclear program is going along at a steady pace but it is not where it was supposed to be see we have a three stage stage nuclear program okay and we were supposed to be in the beginning of the third last stage right now but we are at the end of the first stage homi baba was three stage nuclear program so we should have been now by now in the process of building thorium reactors okay thorium is a whole different uh, element compared to uranium typically the the reactors that we use right now they use uranium as fuel there are uh, like three different isotopes of uranium uranium to plutonium the uranium plutonium is an out outcome of breeder reactions and all you can also use plutonium as as the fuel for reactors but typically it's uranium because uranium is is uh, plutonium was the initial one no uranium plutonium is an artificially created element it was not available anywhere on the earth but it 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 was created as the result of of nuclear reactions so it's typically uranium 235 that is the weapons grade uranium and you have 237 238 also you want to enrich to 235 to make weapons grade uranium but you can use the other one of the other isotopes for nuclear reactions in nuclear reactors and you can then breed plutonium out of it for various purposes um and you can use plutonium also for weapons you can plutonium is a very good uh, weapons grade uh, thing you yes, know yes. element so and you our, have our nuclear uh, weapons are plutonium uh we may have plutonium weapons i'm sure we do we have plutonium <laughs> uh the uh, so we look we have abundant resources of thorium and thorium is a whole different element like i said monazite you, monazite sands in in uh, south south eastern india and we can you know use that also for nuclear power generation so the third stage of our nuclear pro program is thorium reactors in which you can use a blend of thorium and uranium and start the reaction and use the thorium to breed more uranium that can be used to sustain the reaction and so on. that's a whole physics behind it so we are lagging behind in our own plan okay so i think by 20 hopefully if we get our act together then maybe by 2030s 2040 we should be in the third stage and since we have so much thorium why not get there as soon as possible 
then we can generate as much electricity and power as we want from nuclear reactors and very clean, safe nuclear reactors. Okay, so that, that's something that needs to happen. When it comes to nuclear weapons, uh, the world says India has how many? 130? I think they're about. One they always keep it five less than Pakistan. Uh, five less than Pakistan. Take it. China has 370 or whatever. France and Israel and all that. But they always say India is 130. I think, I think the West has a very good idea, may have a very good idea possibly of how many weapons we actually have, nuclear weapons. We, look, the Pakistanis and some other people had done some research. And for Pakistan, we don't need too many actually. No, for Pakistan, Pakistan is not the, not the real problem. China is the problem. China. So the Pakistani, some, some Pakistani researchers had done some estimations a few years ago. They'd come out with a couple of papers. So India has enough fissile material for about 3,000 nuclear weapons. 3,000. Obviously, we will not have 3,000 ready-made weapons. But clearly, the number would be uh, well in excess of 130. So obviously, I, I am not. I am not privy to any classified or confidential information. I'm just doing some guesswork here. But we most likely have more than 130 nuclear weapons, and well, ideally, you would have plutonium. Maybe, more, maybe. maybe many more. Uh, <coughs> ideally, you would have plutonium weapons because it needs you need less plutonium to make a nuclear weapon compared to uranium. Let me give a ballpark figure. You may need 50 kilograms of uranium, of uranium to make a nuclear weapon. You may need eight to ten kilos of plutonium to make a weapon of similar yield. So it makes sense to go for plutonium when it comes to nuclear weapons design. So I think India would definitely have way more than 130 nuclear weapons. Um, the main threat obviously is China. And obviously we never want to use nuclear weapons in any war, but we should be prepared for all eventualities. So yeah. So deterrence. Deterrence. It's all for deterrence, right? Mutually assured destruction and all that. So I think that's where we are in all these technologies. I think we have the potential, the capabilities, the wherewithal, the resources. The funding is available if, we, if, it, if it is channeled in the right directions. So I think if we, if our leadership has the right vision, we can definitely be at the cutting edge by 2030s, maybe by 2040 in all these technologies. Thank you very much, uh, Avijaji. Mm -hmm. We have had a very engrossing discussion on geopolitical uh, and also on certain internal capabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, Vande Mahatma. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, Vande Mahatma. Thank you very much.